Hello, I'm Rosemary Hanna. Welcome to the series, The Bahamas Then and Now, that deals with our arts, culture, and heritage. We'll be talking about those people who were involved and those who continue to be involved in guarding our Bahamian heritage. We'll be right back. Our guest is Patricia Glinton Mikolas, cultural activist, writer, and well sought after speaker. Welcome to the show, Patty. Thank you, Rosie. Glad to be here. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Patty, tell us about yourself, your upbringing, and um, where you grew up. I had a wonderful upbringing. It's something to know that your parents and grandparents, all the people about you, love you. I had that experience. Uh, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, George Trevor Smith, was a headmaster who, and of course, they, many of them were appointed to various islands during the course of their career. His was a 50-year career with the Board of Education first and Ministry of Education afterwards. And so it influenced certainly where I was born and where I grew up. My mother, uh, my older sister, was a sickly child, so my mother wanted to be with her mother for the birth of her second child so she could get the help. Um, my parents lived in, in Nassau, but so my mother went to Cat Island, that's where her parents were posted at the time. And I had the great good fortune to be born at Port Howe in the South. And subsequently, over the, the first um, five years of my life, we spent a good bit of time in the company of our grandparents. Mm -hmm. And it's from that community, that very rich community of traditions and heritage, that I developed my intense love for Cat Island and all the Bahamas and all that we are and we've accomplished as a people. Mm -hmm. Other than your immediate family, who were the Bahamians who would have influenced you, past and present? Well, the thing is, also had the privilege of being, was taught by my parents at home, by grandparents, all of whom were great readers and had a love for language, lit good literature and so on. And so that, that, that was a strong base to begin with. And also had the good fortune to have a series of the kind of teacher who was disappearing from the modern Bahamas. These people had a vocation and it was not um, the children weren't bothering them. They were there to be a part of the formation of good citizens and people of value. And so I can remember, and I've interacted through the years with um, my teachers here in, in Nassau, for example. Dame Ivy Dumont was head mistress at my school down here. Well, my first school here was uh, St. Barnabas Day School. And then, of course, we lived off East Street, so the, the Southern Prep and the, the schools still stand, the junior and senior schools still stand on the corner of mm -hmm. Collins and Wolf Road. And I can remember the names. So, um, grade one was a woman called Katrina Cartwright. Grade two, and, and she, I gather, still alive and well. Grade two was a Frida Thompson. She's the only one who had, she died relatively young. Grade three was Ina Delavaux, who I was so proud to be invited. Her last posting was at Elizabeth Estates Primary School to, be, to speak there. Um, Vilma Thompson, Vilma Thompson Curling, that is, Maria Riley Forbes, 
And it's so wonderful that I ended up interacting with them again as an adult, mm -hmm. you know. And so you had, and they all had excellent language skills, loved language, and they too strengthened that love of language in me. Went on to government high school, and again, of course, that was a powerful influence mm -hmm. when it came to language development, the development of thinking skills, so important, an, an analytical viewpoint on life. And um, of course, Keva Bethel, and again, Keva taught me from earliest days at the government the high school. In those days, yes. And um, of course, mm -hmm. we became mm -hmm. colleagues mm -hmm. when I joined the College of mm -hmm. the Bahamas faculty. Mm -hmm. So what, what um, influenced you to become a teacher? I, well, the thing is, I have to be honest about it. I always had the notion, I knew from my earliest days that I loved to write. If I disappeared, they could find me. And because of the influence of my mother's teaching at home, learn to read and write fairly early. I must admit, write badly. I, my <laughs> penmanship is not none the best, but I love to write little stories, little playlets, for example. Actually, my first forms of writing were little plays, little okay. skits. So how old, I, were, how old were you when you started to do that? As, as the thing is, my earliest memory is I'm, I think I must have been about four years old or so because learned mm -hmm. to do things like t tell time and, and to, to read and all of that very early on. I can remember some of the books. My mother always bought books as presents, for example. And so to access those books, you had to mm -hmm. l learn how to read. So um, that those were the earliest and went on to, to writing little poems. And as, as I grew up, went on to high school and college, just developed a love for prose. But mm -hmm. I decided in self-defense to have a, a short enough form to read, I went back into writing more poetry. Okay. And so I still haven't <laughs> taken on writing a full play because I don't feel that I have enough stagecraft. Okay. But it's something mm -hmm. I would like to do to complete my portfolio. Well, you, you've written so many wonderful publications. Thank Tell us so about much. some of those. Um, Let's see now. I, the, um, my first one really, and I was encouraged by an officer at the Ministry of Education, Verona Seymour. She knew, of course, we connected. She knew that I wrote and she had, they had a visit from uh, an agent of Collins Publishers, one of the uh, editors, I believe, at Collins. She made an introduction and, and this woman asked me to show her some of the things I'd written. I, for my um, bachelor's degree, I had sense enough to know that a wonderful tradition that I'd been exposed to, the folklore, especially the folk tales of the Bahamas, I knew it was a, a rich form Mm -hmm. And when, in fact, I had to ask special permission to do my long study on folk tales because my subject area was foreign languages, but I got mm -hmm. a special dispensation. They were interested enough to know something like that was coming out of the Bahamas. And where did you study? Yeah. At the, mm -hmm. the University of the West Indies. Okay. And that was, it was miraculous. I took to it like a duck to water because here were people from all over the region who celebrated who they are and knew so much of their history and, and so much of their culture and were proud of it. And then that started me looking at the connections. Yeah, they do mm -hmm. this and that we were closely related across the region because I have identified, for example, the Chikchani, I'm doing a lot of research these days on the 
what I call a heritage map tracing um, connections through the folk tales, the folk motifs. And I had left the Chikchani alone for a long time and decided, let me pursue the Chikchani. Okay. And it was just marvelous to discover the names are different, but the descriptions the are unmistakable. The, same, the short figure, glowing red eyes, and feet turned backwards. That's <laughs> so important. It's Tata Duende in mm -hmm. Belize. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I can't re recall right now the um, Brazilian name, but it's just amazing to have found these figures. And then the icing on the cake was met these marvelous Ghanaians in my, on my last trip to London. And I just thought to ask, because we've retained the connection, I thought to ask, you know, do you, do you have any kind of uh, little figures, dwarf figures? And this person, of course, knew about the tradition of two tribes in Ghana because that was his heritage. And to discover that the, the two tribes he's connected with had the same figure but called them by different names. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> It's a fascinating business. Well, Patty, this has been very, very interesting and I'm anxious to hear more about it, which we'll talk about after the break. We'll be right back. You're watching The Bahamas Then and Now. This episode is brought to you by The Private Trust Cooperation Limited, Dungalik Studios, and Easy Light Native Charcoal. This is the Bahamas, 700 islands, reefs, and keys, sporting a distinct history and heritage all its own. This is New Providence, most populated, industrialized island at the center of the archipelago, home of Nassau, the capital city, seat of parliament, Location of political and social revolution, site from which our nation declared its independence. And this is Over the Hill, a community, a series of neighborhoods in what was then considered Southwest New Providence. Settled by slaves, having served as the midwife of national deliverance. Over the hill, a breeding ground of nation builders, constructing trait by trait, precept upon precept, character toting, culture shaping leaders. Over the hill, where independence was born, where the naval string of Bahamianization is buried, where Junkanoo got polished. Over the hill, where sense and sensitivity were kneaded into the dough of children's souls, where people reverently genuflected to the image of God in every man. Over the hill, East Street, Market Street, Blue Hill Road, Bain Town, Grantstown, Anderson Street, Augusta Street, to Fort Hill, McPherson Street, Over the Hill, McCullough Corner, Hay Street, Glinton Square, where? Mason's Edition, Jail Alley, Lewis Street, Over the Hill, the Coakleys, the Smiths, the Johnsons, the Blydens, the DeStoops, the Grants, and the Coopers, the McPhersons, and the Pindlings, the Allens, and the Winders, Over the Hill. The Hannas, the Bostricks, the Burnsides, the Bethels, the Walkers, the Enuses, and the Thompsons. 
the McCartneys and the Gibsons over the hill. What if we went back and dug into the soil of our glorious past? And what if we studied the roots and found the patterns of Bahamian unity and success and progress and superimposed those on the social ills of Lil Nassau, the social ills of the Bahamas in general. What would happen? What would happen if we really understood where we came from? Our heritage is not ghetto. Our language is not profanity. Our resolution is not violence. We are Bahamians, kings and queens, gentlemen and ladies, athletes and warriors in every sphere, geniuses and priests, artists and leaders, and much of it started over the hill. Then and now. Welcome back. Our guest today is Patty Glinton Nicholas. And before the break, we were talking about your publications, Patty. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, all of your writings, or some of your writings, because oh, there are so thank many. Thank you so much. <laughs> the thing is, my love of everything about me, the traditions and all of this, the history. I just have this passion to write about everything in, in this country. So I have written histories, for example. My husband and I have been very much involved in preserving the history, for example, of the Roman Catholic Church in the Bahamas. The most recent book on, on that subject is a very large one that has text as well as photographs. We traveled to all the islands where there are Catholic churches and so I, I think it is it certainly was a rewarding journey for us to meet all of these people of, of the faith for example and I think it is a gorgeous book because Nico of course did all the design on it did a lot of the, the photography my younger sister Carla Glinton who is a very talented uh, photographer was also a part of producing photographs for that publication. I wrote a history of the Flamingo incident, not the details of what happened, it's an analysis of why it happened and it was, that was very rewarding for me doing that research because I came across so many connections, important connections between us and Cuba. I have written poetry, for example, and I, I have been very fortunate to, to be published in some local and international journals. Quite recently, I was named a finalist in the International Provost um, prize um, competition. Quite for an accomplishment poetry. that was. I, I mm. was very proud because the subjects I wrote about in that particular book are not easy ones but I thought needed to be exposed for example. And um, I have written a novel, A Shift in the Light, and I use that for a very important purpose. It is a novel, most people think that I'm writing a history of myself but only partially you, uh, you have, is it um, autobiographical because, for example, I do not have three children and all of that, <laughs> but it encapsulates a lot of the history of this mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. and a lot of the traditions, for example, mm -hmm. and I thought I have to do this to put these things down because many of them are being lost to us. What concerns you um, about the present day Bahamas Party? We have, the way we are defining ourselves is, is based on that loss of history and many of our traditions. And we 
are fast becoming a ruthless people. And when that is the case, when you don't know where you've come from, you tend to grab at things to define yourself and things that don't sit well with our environment or the way we are as a people. Yes. Our education system mm -hmm. so much about us, mm -hmm. there's this ill fit. So that, that concerns me, the way the education system is going. Uh, there was a time when, and still, Bahamians perform outstandingly they do. Uh, going uh, abroad uh, to, to university, for example, but it's not happening for the majority of Bahamians. These are, are very few. And this, it, it, there's nothing wrong with Bahamian brains. I continue to say we have genius. In a way, we have continued the paternalistic system of slavery and of colonialism, where, you know, daddy is going to provide for you. This sense of personal accountability this personal obligation to family, to your own self. That's true. It, we have to go beyond saying, waving the flag, we have it written on paper. But until we live the reality mm -hmm. of independence personally and as a community, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. But politically, we're often led to go along with somebody else will do it. It will be provided for me. I can let my mortgage lapse because somebody else is going to feel sorry for me and the government will, you know, the government them will take well, care that, of it. That's a mentality that's yes. very unfortunate. Um, Patty, in your opinion, um, what does our culture have to do with sustainability? Well, the thing is, there has to be this, for example, if you were born in a place like Alaska, like the Inuit, for example, they have so many, I forget how many words denoting snow mm -hmm. in different forms that would be meaningless to us. We just have snow <laughs> in, in <laughs> English. But to them, that's meaningful because the thing is, you have to fit. Sustainability means that you fit in with your environment. environment yes. If, for example, our heavy dependence on fossil fuels. We don't produce it, at least not yet. So it has to be imported, it's very expensive, and we live in a place that can be easily damaged. The very things that attract people to our islands and that make them beautiful. Mm -hmm. Fossil fuels, especially when they are um, improperly disposed of, can be very harmful to the yes. environment. Why haven't we ex explored more the wind-driven electricity for produced electricity solar. or solar, yes. solar energy, mm -hmm. for example? That's right. Let's talk a little bit about the Bahamian dialect. Right. Um, its place. Yes. <laughs> I, the, the thing is, we have another thing that's left over from our history of, uh, of subordination. Whatever was connected with the people, especially the African descended people, tended to be neglected or declared to be bad and you had to model yourself after the overlords in order to find some degree of acceptability. The point is, the Bahamian dialect, or I prefer to call it Bahamian Creole, mm -hmm. is a language of its own. It bears resemblance to English because the, the lexicon ten, uh, tends, in, in both of them, the lexicons tend to be um, mutually intelligible. Well, not always, because mm -hmm. the way we might pronounce <laughs> some English words you might find an Englishman not yeah, understanding. Yes. <laughs> but it's very much rule governed, it is a language, and the um, syntax is definitely, it, or draws heavily on the African languages of our African ancestry, though it uses for the most part the English lexicon. 
but there are also words and phrases in translation from the African. It's a fascinating language and it's not bad English. It's something we should be proud of. But here is the important thing to understand about it. You have different language forms, people, well-developed people, try to uh, gather in as many language forms because there are many people who speak different ways around us and different registers of language. You wouldn't speak to your child the way you might speak to for example, a college lecturer, that's a difference in register, for example. We need to have both. One is our mother tongue, the mm -hmm. Bahamian dialect yes. Creole. And th that means something in defining yourself. And the other form is more intelligible to people who learn American English, British English, and so on. So you should be mm -hmm. bilingual. Mm -hmm use the form that communicates best in a given situation. situation yes um how do we go about training and encouraging the next cadre of writers well i think i believe strongly that it should start at a very early age reading and writing are inseparable yes yeah, you must have a love develop a love and a facility for language and I always believe that developing a large vocabulary is going to give you a, a greater facility as a user of language, mm -hmm. a, a writer of literature or any kind of well done form of, of writing. That vocabulary is important. Learn the variations in, in syntax, for example. Mm -hmm. Have a good grasp on grammar. Yes. Because even when you depart from that to reflect some regional mm -hmm. dialect, mm -hmm. you need to, to, to be able to handle it intelligently so the reader knows that this is reflective of the particular speaker, not that you don't understand, understand yes, grammar. Um, now, if you were to wake, um, wake up tomorrow morning and the Bahamas is exactly the way you thought it should be, what would that look like? Oh, it, every child in this country would be well loved, well fed, well clothed, and read to at least mm -hmm. once every day, and most definitely would, would have an appreciation for self, for people around him or her, and have a sense of accountability to self and to others. We would have more statesmen than politicians, people who are more concerned about building the country and their people than their party or their particular yes. personal agenda. We would have more true Christians. A true Christian to me is a follower of Christ who, who said to him to his followers what was important to him love does the whole thing we for you know we forget this because it really if you truly love your neighbor we're not going to have the crime we're not going to have the discrimination against people who are different from us that kind of thing and tomorrow that glorious tomorrow I would see those citizenship bills passed in yes. Parliament. We certainly need to have that done. And a Freedom of Information Act and the Freedom of Accountability Act, particularly in Parliament. We need to know if we are taxed, we need to know where our money goes, we need to have the facility to be able to, to share in the decision making of our country. You, I elect you and you get there and tell me shut up or you shouldn't say this or I'm denied anything participation in the good of my country because simply because I don't agree with your politics. Those are the things I would like yes. to see. Thank you for watching The Bahamas Then and Now. We encourage you to continue to watch and we also invite you to urge others to do the same. Thank you so much, Patty. It's been Thank a pleasure. Thank you, Rosie, and congratulations you. to you and your crew. 
on this Kevin and Patrice. Thank you so much for what you do. You're most welcome. Thank you. Yeah.